Thank you for joining us for a special edition of Sunday Connections. Today we have guest curator Julian Robson and artist Joan Tanner discussing her installation Flaw at the Contemporary Art Center. This recording was made during the week of installation, so you may hear a couple of bumps and, and beeps occasionally. But what you'll really enjoy is hearing Joan and Julian discuss the influences that she's had on her work, how Zaha Hadid has influenced the installation, and some of her just insights about the art world. It's been two years, really, that we've been working on this exhibition. That's right. Um, and I remember the very first time that we came up here, I had previously been talking to Stephen Matissia, the curator of the CAC at that point, and I uh, was introducing him to your work, and he was very enthusiastic about it. And can you talk a little bit about uh, that first visit and uh, what your response to the CAC was, and also to the nature of this architecture of Zaha Hadid? Yeah. Well, first of all, I was uh, very um, excited because I'm in, I am from the Midwest and I had not remembered this building um, when I was a young woman. And the reason is it wasn't built. And I know about her architecture and I thought, ooh, this is going to be intriguing. Um, and then we made the tour and remember the, this, the, the large room which is adjacent here was sort of this giant atrium kind of thing, and then here was this narrow place. But I don't remember seeing that initially. But what was interesting was the the uh, conflict in the building that had to do with these concrete parallelograms that are a signature part of how the building operates. The size of lands. The size well, of the, like the one that's actually behind the one that right there, and I was fascinated. A, that it was a parallelogram, that they were uh, poured and left rough, which interested me. And then the other thing is that the distance from the wall, all along here, they are at a different um, me a measurement. And so when we came and he explained a lot of that, and I stood right here in this far corner, and then this incredible elevation, which is 24 feet, but hidden by the soffit here, which is lower, that I thought, well, my God, I might be able to do something interesting. But I was a bit also somewhat overwhelmed, I think. But it was, um, I know she's known for being a brutalist architect, and but there's some kind of, uh, not whimsical, that's a very, not the right word, but he, he knew she's playing with things here. So do you feel, you feel like it's a space that she designed in order to direct a lot of what happens within it? Most likely, I, was, I would have been very curious how she talked about it herself, but to me, I think of this, it's like an addendum now, because in my space now, the entry is, is blocked off, the spaciousness of the first part of the steps. And so that became somewhat, I thought, limiting. And yet now that I've, I've seen what the work is, looks like, it's actually a wonderful capsule. So then again, it comes back to her architecture that she was probably imagining the versatility, which is very intriguing. But in fact, what's interesting is that whilst these big installations you've been doing the last yep. couple of decades are engaging the architecture of where you're working, architecture has featured in your work quite a lot. And when you look back to those very early paintings, you were using elements from architecture um, as, as windows, windows itself as parts of the work. Is there any reason why in particular this interest in, in architecture? Well, first of all, because the basic geometric principles of verticality and horizontal. And I had studied, um, again, when I was in college, the history of architecture and um, the, the essential uh, beginnings of raising verticals to for shelter and so on, and then what those shapes were. 
if you if you pick up a there's a couple of paperbacks that have these incredible, wonderful, old timey woodcuts that are really, really early. Um, trying to speculate how how different in different parts of the world, how people once once they got came away from the caves, well how did they, you know. So I always found that really interesting to think about the fact that um, I mean, why did it have to be, you know, square windows, window panes, and so on? And I, in very young, I was drawing, making these drawings of um, coils and knots and things that were penetrating something that would seem to be a rigid, you know, um, wall. But I was never interested in the texture of bread or wood. I was interested in the psychological idea that essentially a window, if, it, if it's made to be open, or if it, if it, in the early times, if it was just a hole cut into something to let air in. And I, that, to me, is a, a sense of tension. And uh, I, I don't, I'm not particularly a person interested in metaphors or sentimentality is definitely something that I feel is a very tenuous uh, position. We have to think of ourselves as vertical, vertical creatures, and we are, we have certain needs, and I, it isn't about whether I'm inside or outside, I'm not trying to do something kind of surreal, but it is the, the um, I think of it as, uh, I guess, do you, do you, do you, do you, do you, do you like it? We've talked a lot about artists that have interested you and that you felt have been important for your own practice. For instance, like the Art in Pobre artists, um, someone like Paul Tick, um, and then Martin Kippenberger. Yes. But you, you spoke recently to me about Pierre Hume and his video, uh, The Human Mask, that you had seen at Thousand Worth, I think. Or no, in, in LA County. In LA County. And um, it's interesting because here we're talking about that someone is making a video um, and it's something that has a much more filmic quality and, and seems in some ways very different uh, visually to what you are doing. Can you talk a little bit about what it was that interested you about that and how you see it seeding into uh, the, the activity that you're involved in? Um, the film, to me, is, has a lot to do with the lack of sentimentality that is in the film because the, the monkey is traipsing around in the restaurant, opening the refrigerator door, taking out a pop, a, a can of, you know, uh, something to drink, and sits at a table, and then he pats around and pats around in other places. And so the nonchalance, but also what interests me, I think, the most is the tension in the perspective of we, the viewers, thinking, oh, Lord, what next is going to happen? You know, my thing, don't tell me that some horrible, you know, something like a wolf will jump over a wall and eat the, you know. So what I thought was so absolutely mind-boggling was the fact that there was narrative in the sense that it's a film, but how did they do it? But also the tension, which is the presence of this moving creature against a very ordinary background, in, a, in opposition to the kind of, um, what did I say, the tension that I create by making exact and spe specific kinds of pieces that for me are not, um, they don't really have a narrative, essentially. But what intrigued me was the, the presence of this creature that wasn't speaking, and I don't really remember a whole lot of sound, but I know there were sound because it was ratings. But I think that tension is so important. And I, I guess what I did, I, I translate that into what, when you have still objects, and you have objects that are placed purposely when you're utilizing light and so on and color, what kind of presumption is it that you are creating tension? So, you know, it's a, it's a basic psychological kind of 
way that we are ourselves moving around these still objects. And I find, I just, I think that it's a really important piece of work. And even though, I, I mean, I get the fact that it's, you know, surreal, obviously, but that it's a different kind of thing. I found it really interesting. But that sense of, the idea of texture appears in your own work in yeah. different ways, in the way that things are kind of hung from ropes and um, the way that, say, these plastic sheets are kind of all bent around and kind right. of held in some kind of tension to give them shapes. Um, but there's, there's also something else interesting in your work that, that, that um, perhaps relates to the, the work that you've talked to me about of Giuseppe Pannoni. You've talked a lot about the one with the kettles, and it, it seems to me that the, the sense of there being something which effectively is not doing anything, it's just doing what it does. It's, it's creating moisture, wonderful pattern, huge piece that was on a mound of rags under, I guess it had to be a piece of glass that might have been eight feet by eight feet, probably an inch thick, and met big, giant, like restaurant tea kettles on, on um, you know, what are those things, the electric um, heater. And they are bubbling away and the steam is just rising and causing all of this wonderful water and then it's going down there and the steam is kind of, I loved it, it made me so envious that that activity and, and fascinating thing, instead of say project someone projecting a moving river on a wall and saying there you know, I love the idea that that again we were looking at it from the perimeter because each the the um, glass was there were corners that were holding these this glass steady but they were. Basically, it was mounds of rags and whatever, I don't know what it was that was sort of creeping out. Fantastic, um, again, the tension that was passive because we're not, as a viewer, but I also have a lot of interest in theater and I, I kept thinking this is a really fascinating dialogue that, again, that implication of something that hasn't had it. It is discon it's, it's a discontinuity of it, which I think had, has a big, major importance in visual art. And it, it does, that idea of discontinuity and disruption um, seems to be very central yeah. to the installations that you make. Yes, yes. Uh, I mean, is that also a sense of the notion that um, order, that order isn't necessarily framed in the ways that we to presume, you know. Well, if we think about ourselves as human beings, that we are, that is, I think those words describe what we actually are. But um, so you, you've spoken about fractals and you were talking to me the other day about how um, if we were to kind of take a map of the brain, the cells in the brain, that in fact it, it wouldn't, it doesn't sort of um, concur with a, a simple notion of what we think would be orderly, but actually in some ways it looks very chaotic. Very, very. And, and um, I'm not a scientist, and I'm certainly not an expert in any, any kind of sophisticated scientific language, but it does enter the way I think about things, and I'm, I'm, I have to say I'm a junkie to read, um, read about it. But I the complexity of something doesn't necessarily mean that we are doing better. You know, in other words, I think it's it's just the the lack of what would I say for things to be explicit. You know, be um, easy to understand is probably one of the things that. Um, propels everything, let's say. It's like right now. We know we can get a vaccination. We know we're in this dilemma. His, 
still medical historians can tell you what happened at various other times in the world. It's not very good news, but on the other hand, um, each of us have our own life and the dynamics of that, and that's what moves you forward. So I'm sort of thinking of it in terms of uh, the way that you have taken this architecture and you have shrouded, covered, disguised, contravened the, the sense of rigidity and the starkness, if you like, of the architecture mm -hmm. with something that's rambunctious, that's chaotic looking. Um, where whilst there are forms that get repeated and they sort of fall about all over the place. Um, and that seems to me to be, somehow it relates to what you were talking yeah. about when, when you were chatting to me about the brain. Well, one of the things that, and just as you mentioned this, I'm sitting here and looking at the light that's hitting the surface of ordinary plywood. And now I, um, just thinking of the utili util utilizing this because I don't have to do anything because of the kind of light and dark shade shades that are they look they're incredible so I love the authenticity of that and I like the way that this these big things can droop because of how we cut it, jammed it together with styrofoam, and it's this uh, fake thing that they look like um, centuries. And they're made, basically, they are lightweight. They are not ponderous. And I, this is another thing that I think sometimes that art, in order to be believable, needs to be massive and ponderous and um, Possibly, you know, it looks like, oh my God, a human being actually did that. But that isn't, that's kind of a, sort of an old paradigm because so much art now is, is made in very many different ways. So we've expanded the vocabulary, but we even consider, um, you know, the art, art world. There, there's a sense in which you use a lot of, you use a lot of industrial materials in your work. And of course, industrial materials you tend to think of as being rigid structures. You know, if you think of building a house, it's flat walls and a sloping roof and so on. Um, but you seem to imbue them with a kind of organic quality. Can you talk a little bit to that? Well, I guess that is the challenge, that um, they're ubiquitous. You, you can, they're generic. You can easily find them. And it interests me that um, many and all the hardware that goes with it, you know. But what I think of it, I think is, what can I do to change it? How can I utilize it, the angles? What can I put together to, you know, make it work the way I want it to work? And so we do a lot of things that have to do with forcing that material to do something slightly different. So here I'm using plastic mesh, and I'm bundling it and bending it and tying it off with zip ties or whatever else is handy and coloring it to, to conform, make it into something that is malleable, something that I can shape. And then the contrast would be the plywood, which again also has been, some of it has been soaked in, the, in a way to shape it at, uh, while it's wet. And then we, we, we use strappings things to um, keep it in place while it dries and then when it's dry then we can cut it and so the pieces that are hanging from the flexible flexi track uh, ring though that's the, the derivation of how that was done but I I actually don't think a lot about industrial materials I don't really myself go and and uh, you know try to find something if anything, it's partially uh, so accessible. It's what can I do to change it? So I think, and then getting the result I want, it's like, oh, geez, what a bonus. But there are a lot of failures in this. I have to say, I have to confess something else. If I were a real craftsman that 
was going to pour something. And then I had to wait two or three or maybe a week or more for it to cure before I got to see what it was. That would be real torture for me. So possibly as I've gotten to be, maybe I'm more impatient to get a result. I don't know, but it's, I find it really stimulating to go out to my studio. And then from one day to the next, I think, oh geez, that's great. Now I can cut that thing. I can go, I can come at it at a different angle because it's, you know, it's, it's a kind of dialogue. It's, it's an invasion, you could call it, in some ways. And there's a lot of forms also that you use um, repeatedly yeah. uh, that, you, that you create out of these materials. Is there, is there a very particular reason why you... You mean here we're looking at yeah. this thing? You have this modular like form yeah. Yeah, that's repeated in four different ways, yeah. five different ways. Well, I, it, it has a figure, figuration to it in a sense. Uh, this, these big shapes here um, are vertical and then they drew over as a kind of um, forlorn posturing, I guess. Um, I, I don't know exactly how to explain it. They're my friends. <laughs> I don't know whether I can make it any better. Um, so I don't have an answer to that. So somebody was asking me about whether you had any thoughts in relation to whether being a woman has kind of is something that has kind of uh, affected how people either react to work or. Um, or has affected you, say, career-wise in the art world? Well, it's, it, in a way, it's a confusing question to me because if I'm very, very honest about in, in my own personal life, I have to say that either I'm a really dumb bell, I don't ever remember being confronted by a person that I had respect for, let's say it that way, that was either insulting or demeaning, and I'm not. I often think that I'm the most confrontational type of person. Um, in my 40s, when I was beginning to make enough art and had some shows under my belt, and I made forages, I mean, uh, you know, I attempted to make contact, I think I can honestly say that, that I was as, um, not really graciously, you know, or someone wasn't as excited about my work as I wanted them to be, but they were also females, um, art dealers. But the people that, that have been, it's a variety of people, but one of, certainly one of the early shows I was in in LA was called Raw Edge, and it was a show of, of women, painters, and the woman that did the show, was, her name is Ann Ayers, and she was the director of the gallery at uh, Otis Art Institute, which is what it was called then, in Los Angeles. And every, all these paintings, these people, I mean, they were, it was strange painting. The, the, and so I don't have a sense that, and maybe um, part of that is that um, I was a little bit older and working very seriously and I did have a lot of disappointment in, in the sense of, you know, every, every artist I know has the tale of woe. And then, oh, then it, you know, something might have happened. And so to answer that puts me on the spot and I'm hedging because politically and my politics and my personal attitude is I'm completely, um, just outraged about how anybody would hold anything back and not judge people in an egalitarian way, no matter what. So I came from that kind of background, and maybe that was part of the advantage that my parents were very, also very liberal. I didn't, um, I didn't have somebody saying, oh, you can't be an artist, or that's a dumb thing to do, or, oh, why would you want to do that? It was, where do you want to go to school? Now it was in 
the 50s. So I think it, that would be an odd thing for a lot of people that imagine that, that the, you know, the liberal attitude was something that just was invented, you know, last year or something. So I don't know whether I can answer that other than there are people who um, have been very, very generous in helping to look at my work in a way that, that um, saw something that what I, what I was doing related to not just, let's say, a trend of certain kinds of art that was being shown. So I, I wanted to go back to that thing about sculpture and painting. I always had made small objects, and I, when that transition occurred, was a show that was in 1995, and it was in Santa Barbara, a place called the Contemporary Arts Forum, and I made a, a huge amount of work that had to do with sequencing and things on shelves and, and that were um, about art history. And, and that also intrigued me because I could go back and kind of reckon with um, ideas that I hadn't really developed in the big paintings. And so when I stopped painting, it was kind of a gradual thing of not necessarily departing from using color, but I think I just did not really want to be patiently mixing pools of paint, and I painted pretty large canvases. And being the uh, engine, you know, everything then it's in front of me, I needed to be experimenting with a whole different vocabulary. And a lot of it had to do with, with sequential, you know, ideas about how you could expand an idea that had to do with stacking and um, interrupting something differently than on a flat surface. You guys can start whenever you want to start. Okay, um, at this one I want you to start to just talk briefly about drawing. Um, you started as a painter, and then you've been talking about painting and about how color is part of these installations, you know, and you're still using color to a degree here. But do you ever see yourself going back to painting per se? No. I'm too impatient. I, I, I have had sort of odd dreams about having to paint because I couldn't do anything else. And I don't see it. I, I think I'm, I want to rove physically and pick up different things. The tactile idea, you know, is just, it's a great um, release. So does drawing fulfill that Drawing is, role? yeah, because I have a very, very large table, and so when I put big, long pieces of drawing paper, I can literally walk around and approach it. So here I am. Um, I, I can approach it from all these different angles. I'm, I'm old enough that in the early time I would have gone on the floor and um, I would have made things on walls, on the floor, whatever. So that's not going to happen anymore. And um, the I can grind uh, with oil stick and charcoal and, and different kinds of drawing tools. I can mix them up and I like that. I like the physicality, there's no question. So, yeah. so given that your, your work now revolves around this three-dimensional activity that does have color elements in it, and the activity of making drawings, which for you is a very physical kind of activity. Um, here's, here's a question that I'm sure um, I know what the answer is going to be. <laughs> and it is, um, given that you're showing in galleries and museums and so on, um, do you ever see or think about your work being shown in more informal spaces? Um, you know, like doing something in a grocery store or <laughs> um, in a shopping mall? Um, no. Um, if somebody wanted to, to torment me or to challenge me and say, what could you do? That could be interesting. Or I 
could collaborate and be tormented that way. But um, I make work in a studio, which isn't huge, but it's good size. And so I'm, I'm in my fabricator. And we have a lot of di a dialogue that, that goes on all the time. So the idea that the environment that my working most the most I think ideal is where a person can come in to see it in the in this situation where it isn't um, okay. It, it's already so chaotic. I can't think of one of my pieces among the Levitts, for instance. Um, <laughs> You know, or the meat counter. That would be more interesting. But, you know, here's, here's an idea. If there was somebody working in a grocery store that said to me, let's put one of your pieces and <laughs> see, that could be an intriguing thing. But it, essentially, um, I, I've always wondered about bus stop art. And you know, when you are in a major city and you see this thing that is gradually fading and nobody, and it's got, you know, I think that if that is something that has some validity initially, but then it certainly hasn't been kept up. One of the things that I find absolutely valid is the people that actually work, say, on a wall, people like that are making giant, um, uh, all this graffiti, but I'm thinking of other artists who uh, the work is supposed to be someplace that is very, very public and it's supposed to become eroded. So I'm much more apt to say, well, let's make something that, uh, let's say in the, in the 70s there was work that people would go into a place that they weren't really welcome and they take a big wall without permission and start to make something, leave it alone, I can't think of the, the artist right now, and wait, and then the dialogue started because the people that wanted to mark up or say get away, so then she'd come back and she'd make more, and finally a police detective was to send a sign to say, do you know what the heck you're doing? And that dialogue was a dialogue. The, so it, to me, I'm much more interested in the purposefulness of what it is that the artist is the intention. So I that that there's yes, that's what I think. Thank you, Joan. <laughs> sure. That was a, that was a hard one. There's a, there's a lot of conversations we can have about this exhibition and the 